compelling reason to utilize universal groups in your multi-domain uh, infrastructure over just a normal users in the global, global into the main locals. Uh, why, why choose universal? What was the compelling reason for that? Universal groups uh, have to be used with your crossing domain ones. So the only option you have there to get a user from one domain into another domain, the only way to do that is to use another domain. What, um, what disadvantages do you have by using universal groups? Are there any? I don't know. Is there... Are there any problems with finding universal groups that can be resolved by the configuration of Active Directory? Um, if you if you, um, if you set them up and then use, I think the universal groups. That's your right question. Did you do anything? So if your question starts raising the domain functional and front before yeah. functional, I think uh, so. Is there a way to ask that? I'm not sure what you want to ask. Well, basically the same thing. Different. Mm, yeah. Uh, <laughs> What? Uh, <laughs> Without giving away the answer. Right? Yeah. <laughs> the question is the answer. That's the the question, question is the answer. Um, I don't know. 
What so? I think of a better question later. Okay. Yeah. We'll come back to that. You guys are pretty, uh, pretty good. Pretty good uh, demonstration. I do have a question about. Uh, explain to me again how did you allow your sales managers to have the capability of updating their particular users? First, their users were in an OU or in a group. Most of them were in OUs. Uh, so within that OU, you delegate control of that OU. <coughs> you can pick the person or the group that you want to delegate that control to. How would you um, assure that the manager had the ability to only view, let's say, their the particular OU that they're going to manage. What steps or what could you do to to give the manager a tool that this is all they can see? Um, the way we had it set up was those users, there was a sales OU. Okay. So the sales manager only had delegation and control over the sales OU. Okay. So, so, so what tool did you give your sales manager to, to actually they actually modify those permissions. Oh, okay. Modify those properties. Uh, that, that wasn't built. And that was not we, built. No. We did not build that. We would do it for the custom MMC. Okay. Yeah. And set that up as user control. This is the functions that you get. Cool. Right. What, what, uh, what settings did you, or what would you delegate to the manager? What power did you delegate to the manager? Uh, the ones that I remember, there was uh, modified user information, and there was uh, change passwords. I have a question on your DSCP scope. Um, the IP scheme that you guys are using is 10.11, um, you know, 12, 10.0. Slash mm -hmm. 16, correct? Mm -hmm. So that would give you the subnet mass of 255.255.0.0. That's giving you about 65,000 available addresses. However, on, on your DSCP scope, you only split up two scopes between DC1 and DC2 with addresses ranging from dot .100 to dot .175 on one server and on the other you have the range going from 176 to 254. So what are you doing, or what do you do with the rest of the addresses? Actually, what ranges did you actually apply <coughs> to the HP server? Uh, under number, I believe you applied uh, 0 to 254. Right. Was it, was it 1 to 254? Yeah. Dot 1. Yeah, dot 1, dot 1 yeah. to 254. And then what did you do? And the on the shipping location, we split up the warp stations. So the, the first range was assigned. If they logged on, if that went down, we still have reserve pool for the second range. How did you ensure that the DHP servers weren't handing out the same address that they had? We, the we excluded the opposite range on each of the servers. So on the first server we excluded 176 to 254, and then on the second server we excluded the range uh, 100 to 175. So you're on client.